Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, as attendees start to flood in, um, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today for the first uh, We High Parkinson's Disease Seminar of, of 2022. Uh, I really can't think of a better speaker to kick off our series this year um, than Professor Simon Lewis uh, from the University of Sydney, a uh, true international leader in Parkinson's disease clinical research. So it's fantastic to have Simon to present, uh, present today. Before I give a little bit of background to Simon, I firstly obviously like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which I host this seminar today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and also extend those respects to, to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be joining us uh, uh, virtually today. So uh, Simon is a, a clinical neurologist and professor of cognitive neuroscience at the University of Sydney. Uh, Simon has a number of lead positions, but is currently uh, director of the Parkinson's Disease Research Clinic at the Brain and Mind Centre, and also heads the New South Wales Movement Disorders Brain Donor Program. So for a number of years, his research has utilised really cutting edge technologies, harnessing genetics, imaging, and obviously assessment of, of patients in physiology to understand the heterogeneity of the disease and also the complex nature of the disease. Ultimately, obviously, with the aim of improving diagnosis and treatment. His funding has been recognised internationally and nationally and also internationally through NHMRC grants and, and Michael J. Fox Foundation funding. And recently, it was great to see that the programme um, led by Simon was funded by the European Union Joint Programme for Neurodegenerative Disease, disease, uh, disease Research. Uh, so that was great to see that um, recognition and, and um, facilitation of Simon's research. As you can probably imagine, um, being a, a neurologist, he's a staunch, staunch advocate for Parkinson's disease patients and also a lobbyist for their improved support and, and best clinical practice. Um, and if you haven't done, done so already, I very much encourage you to take a look at Simon's website, which is profsimonlewis.com. Uh, I think this is a fantastic resource in particular for patients where Simon provides his insight and also answers questions uh, relating to movement disorders and neurodegenerative disease in, in general. So uh, I very much encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions for Simon, please uh, put them into the Q&A, uh, where at the end of the seminar, my co-host for today, Dr. Sylvie Caligari, will, will pose these to Simon and we'll get through an, as many of those questions as we can. And with that, uh, I'll hand over to Simon and look very much looking forward to your talk. Well, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction and also for the invitation to be part of this seminar program. The, uh, the bottom line is that uh, this is an, an amazing initiative and I think having it open to professionals and the lay public is a fantastic way of go going about things. I'm delighted that it's going to be recorded because I am going to cover a lot of different things. Um, if by the end of my talk your mind is swimming, um, please just spare a thought for how bad it feels inside here uh, with all these things. And it's, this is only a portion of what we're doing. Um, but I wanted to give you a broad uh, cross section, as it were, really to try and top, uh, cover these topics of predicting, diagnosing, and treating um, these diseases that I'm going to talk about. So I'm just going to start off with some disclosures. So you've heard a little bit about my funding. There's no relevant conflicts. And basically, the apologies are that it's a large body of work. We're going to go very fast. If I underrepresent, misrepresent, apologies. So what do I mean by synucleopathies? Well, the professionals on the call will know that we've got a few. Um, Parkinson's disease, probably uh, the most well-known, and uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, I guess, getting more uh, noted. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, some celebrity status, people like Robin Williams, for example. Um, and then probably not so aware of a condition which I'm going to talk a bit about called isolated rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder, where essentially you're healthy, but the only thing that you've got wrong with you at that time when you present is that you act out your dreams. But as you'll see a bit later on, essentially, this is the strongest biomarker we have uh, for people who are going to get Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies in the future. So this is a very uh, important group of patients for our research. So Parkinson's, you probably know it's a disease of aging, but about 5% of patients are under 40 when they get their diagnosis, generally sort of mid 60s, um, but also it's a progressive disease and there's a lot of physical progression, but also non-physical, so the motor and non-motor features. And we know that patients with Parkinson's do have an increased rate of developing dementia and that, but that gets greater over the time that they have their disease. Slightly more men than women, we don't quite know why. Um, and pathologically, there are these synuclein tangles inside the dying cell, synuclein being a protein that's gone rogue. Um, it should be in your cells, but it shouldn't be all tangled up. And so that's the classic feature we see down the microscope when we're looking at the brain of someone who's got Parkinson's disease after they've passed away. 
But important to note that if you've got Parkinson's disease, the studies kind of suggest that you die with, not from Parkinson's disease. So essentially the life expectancy is normal and the quality of life, of course, is significantly impacted. And it is highlighted in this uh, graph, which from Peter Kempster in Melbourne there and um, uh, as colleagues in London from the Brain Bank. And basically what this graph says is it doesn't matter how old you are when you get your disease, you tend to die at about the same age. Um, and the bad parts of the disease, things like dementia, hallucinations, falls, tend to happen in the last couple of years of the disease. So if you're diagnosed in your 40s, the likelihood is you'll have some challenges, but in terms of the bad stuff, it tends to tend, tend to happen, as it were, within the last couple of years of life. Dementia with Lewy bodies, um, again, a disease of aging. And at post-mortem, when you look at people who've got dementia, about 20% of these patients will actually have changes of dementia with Lewy bodies or DLB in their brain. Again, slightly more men than women. And clinically, um, it looks a bit like Parkinson's disease, but also Alzheimer's dementia. So effectively, this is a, a disease that's characterized by its cognitive impact, but also it's got these other features um, uh, of Parkinsonism uh, and things that we'll touch on later, but hallucinations and uh, fluctuations where people zone out and lose concentration uh, and also dream enactment behavior. And pathologically down the microscope, it looks like a bit of a mixture. So most of them uh, will have a degree of Alzheimer pathology to go with the synuclein tangles inside those dying neurons. But it's a more aggressive disease than Parkinson's. Perhaps uh, it does present a bit older. And it may be that actually what you see is that maybe they're the same disease, but people with DLB can resist the disease process. And then finally, there's a bit of a tidal wave um, as opposed to Parkinson's, if you like, play their cards more slowly over the course of a longer uh, uh, progression. And the prognosis of DLB is much shorter. And in fact, it's actually a more aggressive disease with higher costs and more burden uh, than Alzheimer's dementia. And there is a spectrum um, between the sort of pure synuclein and, uh, and mixed uh, synuclein with Alzheimer change uh, that we need to be respectful of um, to understand these conditions. And, and, and this really brings me to one aspect of my work here, uh, which is our, uh, our brain donation program. So effectively, the Sydney Brain Bank, which I think Glenda Halliday pictured there wearing black, um, set up a few years ago, um, uh, mentored from the... Um, Neuro and Neuroscience Research Australia hold uh, the bank, uh, essentially been collecting donated brains from people with Parkinson's and related diseases, probably the best part of 20 years. But for the best part of 10 years, uh, my team have actually been assessing those patients during life, which allows us a little bit more uh, ability to correlate what the changes in the brain are against the features that we see clinically during life. So this is a program that's open specifically to people with Parkinson's and related diseases like DLB, um, but also healthy controls so that we can, if you like, compare. And this is obviously a very important uh, resource that um, I think we've been uh, learning a lot from over the years. And it's important because um, this kind of mixture between Parkinson's and dementia Lewy bodies really hasn't been addressed. So there's the Parkinson's world and the dementia Lewy bodies world, and they just can't decide whether they're two separate diseases or the same. And they've come up with different criteria for diagnosis. And I must say that my team has sort of been walking on both sides of the divide. So I've been part of the consortium that came up with the guidelines for how you diagnose and manage DLB and also part of the consortium who came up with the assessments and the validation of the, the diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's. So I think we all have to learn to play nice and recognize the fact that actually they're sort of same, same, but different. And certainly in terms of patients, it's very important for us to be able to prognosticate and also choose the right treatments if we can decide what diseases people have. But one of the features that I touched on earlier is this. And both of these diseases, Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies, have got this behavior. And this is REM sleep behavior disorder. So REM sleep is when your body should be paralyzed um, and only your eyes should move around the sockets. But you can see this guy is probably having a, a very violent dream and he's acting out his dreams. And actually about a third of these patients will injure themselves or uh, their bed partner. But significantly, people who present with this sleep behavior but don't have any other clinical problems, um, seem to be at very high risk of getting Parkinson's or DLB. In fact, it's said that over 15 years, eight out of 10 of those patients will develop those diseases, about 50-50 between the two. So there's a, an international consortium of which we're part of, 
uh, which has collected over a thousand patients with this isolated RBD um, and, uh, and shown that actually the rate of transition between these healthy people to a disease like PD or DLB is not insignificant. So that's 6% per year of these patients. And as I say, over 10, 20 years, most of us feel that all of these patients will develop something. And in actual fact, when you look um, at clinical cases, at least half of all Parkinson's disease patients have probably got dream enactment behavior. Um, most of the dementia with Lewy body patients have got dream enactment behavior. Um, and in fact, it's actually now one of the core features for helping to make the diagnosis. Um, and also the rarer sinuculopathy, multiple system atrophy, which I won't talk about much more today, has this dream behavior. So if you hear this dream behavior in someone with dementia, the likelihood is it's not gonna be Alzheimer's disease, it's actually gonna be one of these conditions. And we know this uh, very confidently. This is a study that was published now a few years ago, which said basically the vast majority of people who act out their dreams in life, if you do a post-mortem, will have a synuclein disease of death. And as I say, that there are a couple of studies, one from Europe, one from North America, which have shown these sorts of graphs that say basically if you have dementia with Lewy bodies, sorry, if you have a, a isolated REM sleep behavior disorder, your chance over time of developing PD or DLB is very, very high. So you actually do see this um, significant transition to developing um, one of these synuclein diseases. And the risk associated with this um, is said to be a, a hazard ratio or likelihood ratio of 140 times. So for example, many people in the audience will know that if you lose your sense of smell, you might be at increased risk of getting Parkinson's disease. Well, that increased risk is about, I don't know, three or four. Um, whereas this is 140 times. So it's absolutely the strongest predictor we have. And these people, of course, are healthy otherwise. And you could argue, well, actually, if we had a disease modifying drug that could slow a disease like Parkinson's, these are the patients that might stand to benefit the most. In actual fact, you could argue that if you could delay the onset of their disease, you might affect what might be a cure if they could outlive uh, their condition, as it were. And people have been looking at this issue. And I mentioned uh, losing your sense of smell as a risk factor for Parkinson's. One of the other things is color discrimination. So these pastel shades, this is one of those specific tests that really teases patients to see if they can organize these shades from light to dark uh, across these colors. And, and this again has been shown to be associated with uh, conditions like Parkinson's and DLB. And indeed in patients with uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, these features might indicate how soon uh, you're going to transition to one of those conditions. The other feature that we sometimes see in these people is some very subtle physical deficits. This gentleman um, actually has early, very, very early Parkinson's, but he's not swinging that right arm properly. And when you see him turn, um, he turns like he's got a rod through the middle of him, what we call turning on block. And you can see the posture of that right hand is a bit more, uh, if you like, curled up uh, than open compared to the left and the facial expression is down. So subtle physical features, maybe small handwriting, a blank face or you know, a hint of tremor every now and again, um, and things like losing a sense of smell or color discrimination are real indicators. And this is work from Ron Postuma over in Montreal, which really was talking about preparing for those neuroprotective trials. If we had a drug, how many people with this isolated RBD would we need to put into a trial to work out whether the drug could delay the onset of the disease? And interestingly, what I highlight here is if you have patients who act out their dreams, um, they have impaired sense of smell, they have impaired color discrimination, and they have some kind of motor deficit, so perhaps small handwriting, then you'll see that actually you don't need that many people in your trial to get an effect. Um, so for example, in a three-year trial, you might need something like 200 patients, 100 in the placebo arm, one in the treatment arm, to tell you whether or not your neuroprotective or your uh, intended neuroprotective drug actually could delay the onset of disease. So there is an international consortium of which we are part, which essentially is poised, ready to go, collecting these patients and saying, okay, come on, somebody come up with a disease modifying drug. We wanna see if we can slow or prevent the um, progression of this condition. One of the other features that we've looked at, particularly in relation to uh, these patients with dream enactment is, is gait, which of course is a motor function. And gait is very complex. If you think about it compared to talking, it's not maybe as complex as that, but it's probably the next uh, most complex things that humans do, you know, walking around on two feet. 
And in actual fact, we've been uh, looking at patients with this dream behavior and examining their gait using this pressure sensitive mat um, so that we can see whether there are any subtle things that a clinician like me doesn't pick up, but actually the mat with its pressure sensitive recorders could. And this is work um, from Kalina uh, Egitz Martens, who's now an assistant professor back in uh, Canada, which said actually these people who act out their dreams do have gait abnormalities that are different to healthy older people and look a bit more like you see in early Parkinson's disease. This is a very subtle feature that you can't pick up in the clinic, but might be useful as a biomarker, especially if you were doing a trial to see if you could delay the onset of the disease. And then we actually took this a bit further. This is a, an fMRI experiment. So this is a patient lying in the scanner and just under his feet, you'll see there are some foot pedals. You can't actually see the pedals. But what he's got in front of his face is a screen. And, and essentially what we've come up with is this virtual reality um, paradigm where people can navigate um, a virtual uh, reality environment in three dimensions, just pressing the foot pedals and watching the screen. And uh, we've used this a fair bit for some of our other work, which I'll talk about later in the talk. But what we managed to do with these patients with RBD or IRBD with dream enactment behavior and no Parkinson's is actually get them to do this sort of a test in the scanner um, and actually showed that when they were walking and doing some cognitive tasks on top of that, that the signal changes in the brain that we record with the scanner um, look different to healthy older people and in actual fact look more like people who've got early Parkinson's disease. So not only are we seeing physical changes, but we're actually seeing the neural correlate, what's going on in the brain that might explain um, what's, uh, what's being manifest in the feet. So again, not only a, a, another biomarker that we might be able to tap into for future, future research trials. And then the other thought that uh, occurred to me a few years ago was that um, when we're looking at dream behavior and this um, breakdown in the natural ability to keep the body from acting out the dreams, the pathology would be localized, we think, in an area of the brain below the thinking parts called the brain stem, above the spinal cord, but not in the brain itself. Um, and that's also the area of the brain that controls your body temperature. And a lot of Parkinson patients tell me that they can't control their body temperature. They get too hot. They feel the heat. They're very sensitive. And in actual fact, one of the things that uh, we wanted to explore was the fact that normally overnight, um, all of us healthy people are able to drop our body temperature. So we go to sleep at night, we bring down our metabolism, we drop our body temperature. And when we wake up in the next morning, the body temperature comes back up. But what we um, have done now is to take patients with Parkinson's um, and dementia with Lewy bodies with the dream behavior and without the dream behavior, as well as those people with specifically uh, isolated REM sleep behavior disorder, and look at what happens to their body temperature overnight. And what we found uh, was very interesting in that if you have dream enactment behavior, that is to say pathology, probably in that part of your brain that also controls temperature regulation, you are not able to drop your temperature overnight. So patients with the dream enactment behavior, whether they have uh, that with part of their DLB or Parkinson's or isolated dream behavior, they can't drop their body temperature overnight, whereas healthy controls and people with Parkinson's who don't act out their dreams, um, effectively they can regulate their body temperature. So they obviously have some preservation of that part of the brain. And this is um, in line with what we heard about a little earlier, which uh, is a European consortium grant that we have, which tapped into this concept of whether there are different types of Parkinson's disease, which means to say, could Parkinson's in some patients start, say, in the brain and then spread out or start in the body and spread up? Um, top down versus bottom up. So people complaining of things like constipation first or fainting first before they start getting the physical symptoms versus acting out their dreams first and then developing their physical symptoms later. So this um, funding that uh, Grant mentioned in the introduction is a European collaboration. And what we'll be doing in that study is taking these patients with um, Parkinson's disease with and without dream behavior, as well as these other patient groups um, to see uh, uh, what we can see and see if there is this divide between potentially two types of Parkinson's disease, one that starts in the brain and one that starts in the body. And this really relies on our assessment clinic. And um, so we tend to do standardized assessment in my research clinic where we take the history, we look at the medications, we do some physical rating scales, a lot of questionnaires, some cognitive testing. And then these other things that I mentioned, you know, testing smell, vision, and, and the gait on a special mat. 
brain scanning techniques, but also in addition, um, looking at genetics. And this is John Kwok who does our genetics work. So looking at the genes that can influence um, these diseases. And also um, in collaboration with Nick Zanko, who's a marvelous uh, biochemist here as well, looking at some potential blood biomarkers uh, that might be able to help us map these diseases and make more accurate diagnoses or plot how their disease is traveling. And so just to touch up on that uh, um, blood biomarker work, this is um, a small story about a thing called glucocerebrosidase, which is an enzyme. And it's an enzyme that works inside cells to clear garbage away. And so this is an interesting enzyme because we know in children, uh, most commonly, there's a condition called Gaucher's disease, which is genetic. And you, you're basically, you don't have a gene that can make this enzyme. So mum and dad failed to give you a gene that could do this. And you end up not being able to cl clear garbage from your cells. Um, and actually, these children generally die in childhood. But interestingly, if they live into adulthood, a number of them will develop a synuclein pathology in their brain. They look a bit like dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's. Significantly, um, what uh, the studies have shown is that actually amongst people with Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, if you've got one working copy of the gene, but one faulty copy, you actually also see this as being a risk factor for Parkinson's. So in actual fact, this inability to have the enzyme working very nicely and clearing garbage like tangled alpha synuclein protein from your brain seems to be associated with the risk of these synuclein diseases. So this is work from uh, Nick Zamko, who has um, developed a, a flow cytometry technique looking at white blood cells, specifically at monocytes. And this is work done where we've taken blood from Parkinson's patients who don't have any problem with their genes. So they have two working genes um, and some patients, some healthy controls. And what we showed initially was that even in, if you've got two working genes, the level of that enzyme is reduced compared to healthy controls. So again, a clue as to what might be causing the disease or driving the disease. And interestingly, more recently, we've actually been able to correlate the activity of this enzyme with the degree of physical severity of the rating scale that we use um, to assess motor features in Parkinson's disease. So this has given us some confidence, not only with the diagnostic work that I was talking about in relation to diagnosing Parkinson's or DLB early, but also in regards to some of our clinical trial work, um, looking at whether we can modify the, the progression of the disease. And this relates to a thing called the Australian Parkinson's Mission, which I'm the principal investigator, which is uh, funded by the federal government to the tune of 30 million. And the plan is to get a series of clinical trials running across Australia, across the states and territories, um, assessing drugs that might slow the progression of the disease using things like genetic markers and these biomarkers to say, OK, are we able to see an impact of this drug on the disease clinically and also at the biological level? And indeed, the first study is already running. So this is our first trial. And what we did with it is do a little bit different to in most trials. And we actually had three different drugs uh, included in this trial, as well as a placebo arm. So this is, uh, means that if you're included in this trial, you get um, a one in four chance of getting a sugar pill and a three out of four chance of getting one of these three different drugs that we picked from a panel of drugs selected by some experts to say, okay, we think that this might impact the progression of Parkinson's disease. And this trial is using repurposed medications that have been used for other things in humans, so we know they're safe, but there are some clues um, that suggest that they might help slow Parkinson's disease. And that trial, as I say, is recruiting. I think we've got over 100 people now across Australia, multiple centres. And, and if people uh, are interested in knowing more about that trial, it's uh, a website that you can go to, all the Ws, theapm.org.au, uh, and there's information there. And there are centres across uh, most of the states that are up and running at this time, despite the challenges of COVID, but we are running. And there are our plans to do more of these disease-modifying trials. In terms of other trial work that we're doing, I have a number of other industry trials looking at um, symptoms, and we've done some other disease modifying trials. But just within our own team, uh, I wanted to talk about some other things. I mentioned uh, dream enactment behavior, and for many years, people have been using a drug called melatonin, which is a natural hormone in the brain, to try and treat patients with uh, dream enactment behavior. And so we were prescribing this medication very happily, but no one had ever done a trial until my team um, did that, um, comparing melatonin against a placebo, and showed that actually it doesn't seem to help with dream enactment behavior. So this has really changed practice because 
this drug you know is not cheap and in actual fact it doesn't seem to work in actual fact the other drug that uh, people do prescribe for this clonazepam uh, probably a dirtier drug of benzodiazepine um, was trialed around about the same time by a group in korea uh, and they found that it didn't work either so at the moment i think we're in a bit of a limbo as to what best uh, treatment to offer patients who act out their dreams other than saying look get a bigger bed make sure you're safe don't fall out of bed and hurt yourself in terms of other trials, we have done uh, non-drug trials. So this is cognitive training. Sharon Naismith there, the, uh, the lady in the striped shirt at the front who led this initiative, a neuropsychologist of great repute. And we've showed with cognitive training a couple of times a week for seven weeks, we could actually improve cognition in people with Parkinson's disease. And now we sort of advocate um, the online brain training programs like Lumosity and Brain HQ as something that might help uh, improve your cognition in Parkinson's. In addition, uh, we've also used this same sort of approach, training cognition um, to improve gait disorder. I mentioned that gait is one of those things that relies on a lot of um, function across the brain. It's a very complex thing that we do. And interestingly, we're very specifically interested in a thing called freezing of gait. And I'll talk about that uh, in the next section a bit more in depth. But essentially freezing of gait where you can't uh, maintain your gait, you stick uh, onto the floor. Um, and what we had shown previously was that people who have freezing of gait with Parkinson's disease seem to have some selective cognitive impairments. In fact, what they can't do is divert their attention. So concentrating on things and then swapping between tasks is something that's challenging for them. So we actually set up a trial that funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation to see if we could improve um, not only their cognition with cognitive training, but it reduced their freezing of gait. And in actual fact, this study did show, it's the only trial that has shown um, some benefit on uh, freezing of gait. Um, that did show that we could actually improve um, some of those freezing symptoms in patients with Parkinson's. So another good reason to advocate cognitive training, which of course has no side effects, but does require a lot of effort. So freezing of gait, um, I wanted to talk more about it. This is uh, a lovely picture of the wrong kind of gait, but uh, this is my, actually my parents' gait back in Wales. And um, if people want to know why I moved from Wales, this picture is pretty uh, good uh, reason. I think uh, you can see the weather is rather different. New South Wales is one of those few sequels that is much better than the original. Um, and so I was very happy to move. But this is really when John Marshall's there. Parkinson's medication wears off, this is what happens. He's stuck, unable to walk properly, a condition called freezing of gait. So freezing, a you know, very troubling symptom, affects a majority of patients as they get older. And of course, it's associated with falls, poor quality of life and ending up in a nursing home. So a big challenge because the treatments we have are just not very good. And for those interested in, in freezing, this is a review I wrote in um, Brain with a number of experts from around the world, which reviews where we are with understanding uh, freezing across uh, its clinical features, as well as some of the other things like imaging and neurophysiology and, and, and potentially genetics. And this, um, this really followed on from um, some work that I did uh, when I was back at Cambridge, when I uh, really had to think about what was going on in the brain of patients when they were freezing, because this is um, something that's paroxysmal, so it's not there all the time, it obviously tips over. And I, I figured that there probably is some kind of decreased reserve across the circuits of the brain. In fact, I think it's probably more networks now. Um, and then when it gets overloaded, there's a problem that comes and then goes. Um, and you can get over this with various um, strategies like focusing your attention on something, you know, cueing, such as walking over lines that are represented on the floor would be the classic um, uh, feature that people are, are aware of. And so just to sort of take you through the model that I proposed back in what, 2009, um, it sort of kind of comes like this. And, and essentially things like thinking, moving, worrying or anxiety, um, or if you want to make that a bit more neuroscience sort of cognition, uh, motor control and limbic uh, pathways, all feeding through this funnel, which essentially is the striatum or the, if you like, mission control, the central part of the brain. And that's the part of the brain that really relies on the neurotransmitter dopamine, which of course is one of the things that goes missing in Parkinson's disease as the cells that produce it die. So normally you can do all of these things together and you can increase the amount of things you're doing. So you can walk and chew gum and worry and do all those other things. And generally, if you don't have Parkinson's, there's no problem. However, if you've got Parkinson's, your funnel has got a bit of a narrowing in it um, because you have less dopamine. And so when you up, or even at the best state, your walking isn't great. So a bit of a shuffle at the best of times. But if you up 
one of these things or all of these things. So for example, if you're trying to make a turn and you're worried that you're going to fall over and you're thinking about carrying something at the same time or someone's asking you a question, you increase the load going through um, the funnel and essentially it gets blocked. And this is what then manifests clinically as a freezing episode. And of course, then what happens when patients want to move their feet is they say, OK, I'm just going to focus on my feet. So actually, I'm going to reduce the, um, the, the load on those other pathways. I'm just going to move my feet. I'm going to step over that line or whatever it is that gives you the ability to restart walking. And so this is um, a little bit more of a, a neurosciencey picture to show you that. So on the left side, what normally happens, but on the right side, where you take out the dopamine and the striatum there at the top, and you basically put pressure on all these other pathways in the brain. And effectively, what happens is you get this massive wave of inhibition coming out of the output nuclei of the basal ganglia, which means that the brainstem shuts down. So you don't get signals going down to the spinal cord to tell your feet to move. And also going up through the thalamus, it shuts down the cortex. So effectively, you, you don't have the ability to override it <clears throat> so well. So that was a great theory. The question is how to investigate it. And what I thought initially was that we should have a look inside the brain, but it's very difficult to look at the brain while someone's walking around. So that was where uh, the idea of this virtual reality, which I showed you a bit earlier, uh, came along. So the idea of basically putting someone into a virtual environment where we could manipulate their environment, the cognitive load, the amount of anxiety, for example. And so uh, this is a bit of a bigger picture just to show you that as people are taking steps, they're walking through things like doorways, which can trigger a freeze. We can give them cues to stop and walk and in the background you'll see on the screen there we're timing everything how often their feet are moving if there's a, any uh, delay or a, any hesitancy of their feet stop moving and this is just to sort of pair those sort of images up and you can see here a freeze gets that doorway and and the feet stick to those foot pedals and so this is a, a freezing event um, that uh, you know looks a little bit like uh, the freezing that we see in the real world and just to sort of put them side by side you know, this is someone walking with freezing and someone using the foot pedals. And you can see that sort of wobbling or what we call trembling in place uh, when the foot sticks to the ground. So we thought uh, that this uh, paradigm probably does model freezing. Of course, it doesn't have balance. It doesn't have a lot of the aspects of gait. But as a model, um, it was better than going into the scanner and just thinking about walking and thinking about freezing, which to me just doesn't really get at the neural circuitry. And in actual fact, uh, this is an old study now where we actually were able to correlate the amount of freezing that patient had in the virtual reality environment with the amount of freezing they had when doing clinical timed up and go tasks, walking around in the clinic and making turns and the like. So it does look as though the paradigm is mapping into uh, the actual freezing phenomenon. And as I've showed you earlier, we have this setup where we can actually get the patient to do this task lying in an MRI scanner. And, uh, and uh, this is one of the uh, first studies that we published on this, uh, which basically said, OK, well, let's have a look at what's going on in the brain. So when people are walking normally, that's one section of the scan. But if their feet stick and they have freezing, so they sort of stick to the foot pedals, then that would be another part of the, 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 the temporal sequence of the fMRI scanner. So if you were comparing the freezing against the walking, um, you should then be able to say, OK, what is different about the two? And interestingly, what we showed was um, that the region of the legs, the, the cortex that controls the legs, um, and the region um, deep within the brain uh, goes up um, from the striatum to, to tell those um, things to shut down. And then we also saw this increased activity in areas outside of the normal motor control, the supplementary motor area, to try and, if you like, presumably get the feet moving again. And in actual fact, we also looked at um, parts of the brainstem, um, which are associated with the, the, the movement of the feet. And actually, the, the degree of activation there correlated with the amount of freezing that patients had. And we've been able to take this further and look at the role of dopamine and also cognitive load. And it's a bit of a busy graph, but essentially people with who don't have freezing, it doesn't matter if um, you take away their dopamine tablets and put them under high cognitive load, you can actually see that the networks of the brain that control the movement of the feet and talk to the deep parts of the brain keep talking. But when you look at patients with freezing, as soon as you increase the amount of load, so trying to get them to do two things at the same time, cognitive tasks plus moving their feet, you'll see that red and green line, which represent the activity in networks of the brain dis disappear. They sort of stop matching each other, they decouple. And so in actual fact, there's a breakdown in those networks.
Clinically, we know there are a number of features that can trigger freezing of gait, um, such as turning, um, doing two things at the same time, dual tasking and doorways. So we've actually been able to manipulate the environment of the virtual reality to look at those triggers. Um, so this is someone turning and having a bit of a freezing episode. You'll see that they get to the turn there and their feet stick. And if you look at that clinically, we can actually see their eye movements as they take the turn, boom, boom, boom. They actually have a saccade, their eyes jump as they make the turn. You can see it goes in the opposite direction when they turn in the opposite direction. And when we did this in the uh, uh, virtual reality environment, where you can see as this person turns to the right there, you can see boom, 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 the eyes are moving and they sort of have the same thing as they turn to the left, boom, boom, boom. So they're making saccades. Despite the fact they're sitting in a chair, moving their feet on foot pedals, you can actually, if you like, trick the brain into thinking they're turning. And this is work published by Moran Gillat, who's now an assistant professor in Belgium, um, showing the parts of the brain that break down during that. And this is dual tasking, so doing two things at the same time. November. September. It's been asked okay. to give you the month of the year it. before the one we shout out, and it triggers a freeze. And this is Max Shine, one of the original studies showing the parts of the brain that fell during this dual tasking. And here's a doorway freezing episode where someone's coming to a doorway. And you saw the doorway um, uh, video I showed earlier. And again, I think this was um, uh, Eli Matar. Uh, who's just finished his PhD now, um, showing the areas of the brain that break down with this doorway freezing. But brain scanning is slow. It doesn't tell you in real time what's happening, and it doesn't tell you um, about you know, all the things you need to know. So we thought we'd go to neurophysiology, so electrical recording. So the first thing we looked at was EEG, and um, so recording the brainwave activity from the outside. And we've published a number of studies now that show in actual fact that not only can we see what happens during freezing as an electrical signal from the surface EEG, we can actually see that it, it actually uh, changes happen two to five seconds before the feet stick. So this might give us a warning that we could actually translate into a treatment that we could stop people freezing in real time by perhaps giving them feedback when we detect that signal. And furthermore, what we've also done now is gone into the operating theater when people were having um, their deep brain stimulation uh, for Parkinson's disease. And this is the setup. You can see the surgery going on there. You can see the foot pedals at the bottom and you can see a big screen. So these patients are awake in their scanner, having the electrodes in their brain. And what we showed again is when their feet freeze, there is a burst of activity in that part of the brain. And now we're working um, to see if we can detect that in real time um, from the actual device. These new deep brain stimulation devices can actually sense what's going on in the brain as well as send electricity in. And this again might be a way for us to detect a freeze before it happens, change the settings of the deep brain stimulator and perhaps even abort a freeze before it happens. That's our long-term plan. So I want to just shift to some other stuff uh, that we've got going on, and that's hallucinations. Which is going to be the last part of my talk. One of the other things I'm fascinated by is hallucinations. And so um, this is probably how some of my hallucinating patients see me, um, hopefully not as a rat, but uh, maybe a bit distorted. Um, very important things, hallucinations, because they're probably the strongest predictor of who's going to end up in a nursing home. So patients will start hallucinating and start getting psychosis delusions where they believe things that aren't real are much more likely to end up in a nursing home. So it'd be great for us to have some understanding of hallucinations and then hopefully get better treatments. And again, this is um, some work we published a few years ago now when I wanted to sort of put my mind to what's going on in the brain when somebody hallucinates. And so I want to talk you through again some networks of the brain in very simple terms, because I know we have a mixed audience. But effectively, if we take you through this example, this is a coiled green thing that might find lying in a garden. Um, now, if you're normal and don't have any problems in your brain, uh, then it looks like a hose pipe. But if you've got some impairments, um, then you, you might have problems. And the way we sort that out is there's a thing called the ventral attention network, which deals with salience, i.e. What's, what's a threat to me? And these are these parts of the brain eliminated here in green. And there's also the default mode network. So the default mode network is what you've been using during this talk where your mind is wandering off and doing other things and also involves things like recalling things to memory. So you may recall the fact that you put a, a hose in the garden or you may recall the fact that snakes live in Australian gardens. That may not be so helpful. So generally what happens is through the basal ganglia, which is the part of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's and DLB, um, you get the, if you like, the arbitrator, the dorsal attention network. And the dorsal attention network says, okay, I'll work this out for you. I'll tell you what this thing is. And I'll give you all the evidence and feedback and tell you whether it's a, a proper uh, snake or a hose pipe. 
But of course, in Parkinson's and DLB where that's affected, we can often have a breakdown, or the theory was that there'd be a breakdown in that dorsal attention network and people would misperceive the, 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 the host pipe as a snake, for example, in this, in this worked example. But you need a way of testing that. So one of the things I wanted to do was to try and trick the brain. And I, I invented a thing called the bistable percept paradigm. And this is just sort of an example of what I mean by that. Um, the image on the right, many people will be familiar with, it's bistable. It's either a vase or two faces in profile looking at each other, but it, and it can be both. But your brain can generally work that out. Whereas the picture on the left doesn't look like anything other than a wonky candlestick. But what we suggested or what I thought perhaps would be that patients with hallucinations may struggle um, in two different ways. One, they may fail to see the second image. Um, and the other, they may actually misperceive an image entirely and say, well, actually, I, I see the face of the devil um, rather than anything else. So <clears throat> we can then make an error score from that and see whether people are struggling. And, and just to give you an example, this is a, a picture which is bistable in some ways. You can see the deer in the foreground, but in the trees, there is a, a stag hiding. But of course, if you've got one of my diseases, you might even see these figures as shadowy, menacing looking people. And here's an example. That looks like a nasty piece of work there, of a figure of something to fear, the eyes and the fear. mouth. Eyes of that. So he's making and things the, up. These two look picture. like animals of some sort looking at the horse. So, in actual fact, when we did the experiment and began using functional MRI, what we were able to show was that the patients who had hallucinations could not activate their dorsal attention network. So they were left to their own devices, as it were. So they were uh, not able to correct the ambiguous percept. And then we, we also did then this is again, Max Shine, um, was to take hallucinators. Um, when they were hallucinating and see what conversations were going on between these networks of the brain. And in simple terms, what we found was that the activity of the dorsal attention network that sorts things up out was uh, reduced, but the uh, other networks, the ventral attention network and the default mode network, they were increased. And in actual fact, what also was going on was that there was a big mistalk going on. So in actual fact, they, the dorsal attention network was not talking to these other areas, but in actual fact, the default mode network, which conjures up memories, was talking extensively to the visual network where you see things with your mind's eye, as it were. So in actual fact, it looks like uh, this hypothesis, uh, the attentional network hypothesis may explain what we're seeing in hallucinations, because in actual fact, you have this problem where because of the disease, you can't engage the network that would normally correct these errors. And then parts of your brain start talking to your visual cortex and say, hey, I think I see something bad here. And they think it, see it as threatening. So using this, I'm hoping we'll be able to um, do more in the imaging sense, but also with future studies, maybe looking at drugs, because we might need smaller trials to actually evaluate these using biomarkers, where we could say, well, if we give people with hallucinations this drug, does their picture get better? Rather than recruiting 200 people with hallucinations, you might recruit 20 and say, hey, this drug seems to make those um, tests better. It might give you confidence to then go and do the trials. So it's been an absolute romp. Um, I've tried to keep it as short as possible so we can have as long as possible for questions. So just in summary, um, if we're talking about predicting and diagnosing, uh, I talked about the patients who act out their dreams who are otherwise fit and well, isolated RBD patients. And these represent our best bet of being able to predict patients with PD and DLB before they get the disease. We can assess them clinically and say, look, you have got small handwriting, you've lost your sense of smell, your color discrimination is awful. Therefore, you're much more likely to transition to one of these diseases sooner than somebody who comes in and says, I just acted my dreams and the rest of the testing is normal. I mentioned some of the biomarker work for diagnosing and, of course, some of the brain donation uh, studies in terms of helping us refine what we, we regard as, as accurate diagnosis. And then in terms of understanding pathophysiology, I, I think I uh, hope I've told you a little bit about the symptomatic treatments. And um, once we've understood the neural correlates, it's easier for us to say, OK, we think freezing is related to this surge of activity here. How can we detect it in real time? How can we correct it in real time? And I also talked about things like the disease modifying treatments, which are really happening. People are doing trials to see if we can slow this disease down here in Australia. So please, if you're a patient, think about getting involved in these sorts of trials. It's important. And then in terms of the future, I didn't touch on this, but there's a lot to do. Um, and as I say, I've kind of covered um, 
not everything uh, that we're doing here in Sydney and, and collaborating with people around the world, but uh, it really relies on fantastic uh, volunteers and from the patient community. And without them, we, we really couldn't do much. And of course, the other people it relies on are the, are the smart people that I have in my team um, who uh, are represented here. This is us at our Parkinson's charity work in, uh, walk in 2017, uh, celebrating the 200 year anniversary of James Parkinson's an essay on the shaking palsy. Uh, and with that, um, I'm going to close. Uh, I'll stop um, sharing my screen. Um, but I just wanted to say again, thank you for the invitation. You'll see my email is on there. You've seen the website earlier at www.profsimonlewis.com. And I'll pause there and hopefully uh, if there are any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Simon, for this very insightful talk. Um, we will now take questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box down the bottom and I will read it out. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and I will unmute your microphone. Okay, so we already have a question in the Q&A box from Melanie Barlow. She asks, do PD patients show abnormal responses to general anesthesia? It's a fabulous question and the answer is probably not. Um, so you, you, um, if you're talking about just Parkinson's with general anesthesia, so I, I published a paper on this uh, with one of the medical students actually uh, a few years ago, and I was just trying to Google while we were uh, having this conversation to find the reference for you, I'll pop it in the box. Um, and basically, if you look at general anesthesia and Parkinson's, it doesn't seem to make Parkinson's worse. Um, you have to be very careful, though, around, and certainly and, and DLB uh, even more careful. And um, so the risks around um, anesthesia with these diseases really are perioperative. And that is most acutely felt as a delirium, postoperative um, delirium. So basically, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the more cognitively frail um, or the more non-motor features that a patient has who's got PD or DLB, the higher the risk of a delirium. So one has to be very careful. And, and often um, I'll, I'll um, see patients and I'll say, look, you're going off and you have this operation. Number one question, can they do it under some other kind of anesthetic? So, for example, a spinal block might be suitable if someone's having a hip replacement, it's possible. Um, similarly, um, I, I generally write a letter to the to the surgeon and the anaesthetist who are looking after that patient, and I cite the paper and I'll try and find it while we're getting more questions in, and um, basically saying, look, these are the things to watch out for. And the, the classic traps are giving the patient opioid medication afterwards to relieve their pain, often sends them crazy. Um, and then obviously the concerns about whether when to restart Parkinson medications if patients are milled by mouth, for example. So there are a number of things to be careful about, but in terms of general anesthesia, making those diseases worse, there's no good evidence for that. Um, it's reassuring. So if you're due to have an operation, you should go ahead and have it. But the key is to planning the operation because mainly the risks around post-operative delirium. Uh, Grant has a question. Fantastic seminar. Thank you, Simon. Really appreciate it. Really insightful. Um, so first question would, would be, I know it might be difficult to detect because obviously you can't detect Lewy bodies until, you know, in post-mortem, but in RBD, do you, is there incidence of Lewy body deposition at that stage? Yeah, there is. Um, so there are a very limited number of studies that have actually got post-mortem patients who during life have got um, polysomn polysomnographically um, diagnosed um, REM sleep behavior disorder. And in those, you do see uh, Lewy body deposits um, in um, critical regions of the, um, of the brain. So I think, uh, you know, in, in the brainstem pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there is evidence that it's there. Um, um, the other question I had, and it's obviously a bit premature to talk about the APM trials, but I wonder if you could yeah. just give your thoughts on, you know, which disease modifying strategy, I guess, are you more most excited about at the moment? Yeah, look, I think um, obviously the big end of town um, is spending money on monoclonal antibodies. So all of the drug companies mm. are basically putting money in monoclonal antibodies. So that, um, for the for the incognitia, uh, the idea here is that normally your body fights diseases, infections by creating antibodies. And here we're saying, well, there's a tangled protein. If we could have antibodies, it would stop that protein from accumulating or sticking to itself, or we could break it down. That would be our approach. And of course, we're stealing that approach from Alzheimer's dementia. And of course, you could argue that they've had 25 years of pretty much non-success, um, controversial. But um, the studies that have been done in Parkinson's, um, and there are about three of them now, have also been negative. 
And so um, they're generally not long studies, but they're expensive studies. Um, one of them, uh, the concept is now to go um, back and use the same drug, but to select uh, the patients more carefully um, and see whether they can get a signal. I have to say that it is very reminiscent of what happened in Alzheimer's disease. Um, where you saw this sort of, you know, oh, it's just, you know, it's just we haven't treated them early enough. And, you know, it's like, it's almost like a, an antenatal study that we need to do in, in Alzheimer's dementia before children are even born. That's when we need the monoclonal antibody. Um, taking ourselves away from the monoclonal antibodies, um, I guess the, the, there's quite a broad spectrum of things. I mentioned the story about glucose, glucose rubricidase, and that enzyme has actually got, as you know, an interaction with synuclein. Um, so in actual fact, the activity mm -hmm. seems to be correlated. And so there are drugs that are, are able to uh, target that area. Now, the, the one that's already been trialed by industry was unsuccessful, but people have argued that perhaps it was hitting the wrong target. And there are other trials um, looking at repurposed medications, one um, a sort of cough medicine, uh, which may be uh, a, a better approach. Across other things, um, it's in, it, a lot of the clues have come so far from epidemiology. Um, so, for example, we know that for whatever reason, people who smoke seem to have a reduced risk of Parkinson's. Don't start smoking. It's not going to help you kill you with something else. But um, people have trialed nicotine. It didn't seem to slow progression. Um, but for similar examples, we know from the literature that patients who have been exposed to the blue puffers, uh, which are beta agonists rather than beta blockers, which are to lower your blood pressure. And these things basically work on the same sort of uh, sites, um, but in opposite directions. In actual fact, the blue puffers seem to reduce your risk of getting Parkinson's and the beta blockers seem to increase it. And similarly, we're seeing the connection with diabetes. Um, and so patients with diabetes seem to have a more aggressive Parkinson's. And in actual fact, patients on certain anti-diabetic drugs, which work in specific ways, seem to have a lower risk of getting Parkinson's and already probably, I guess the most successful trial we have so far is a diabetes injectable drug called exenatide, which in a phase two study done at one center by my old mate, Tom Fultony, in just 60 patients, 30 versus 30 placebo versus drug, suggested it might slow the disease. And so there's a much bigger trial, I think 200 patients going over through, I think it's a two year follow-up period, uh, which is now underway. So I think that uh, as opposed to five, 10 years ago, I would never really want to talk about disease modifying strategy. We actually can talk about it now in, in a sensible way. And so we have strategies, we have targets. The big problem is, and I think it's going to be a bit like this, is that it's a bit like the kid with the finger in the dike and you go, okay, I've closed that down. And the question then is, will it drive another pathway? Mm -hmm. Will it drive things like oxidative stress, mitochondrial disease, well, like ferritosis or whatever. Um, so in actual fact, you might, you know, find that you, you've, uh, and similarly with synuclein, I mean, synuclein is being painted as the bad guy. Um, mm. And synuclein may be the good guy. It may be trying to save your cell in the best way that it knows how. And then you go along and say, oh, let's get rid of that. And wildfire rips through your brain. So it's a bit of a challenge that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, it's quite a few questions. So David McTyre has his hand up. I'll just unmute your microphone. David, would you like to ask your question? It appears still to be muted on my screen. I don't know. Um... Yeah, he's, I think uh, he's Hey, how are you? Uh, I, was just wondering, I was just wondering what the drug was that you used in the uh, experiment. Which drug we're using in, in what? Sorry, because you get a bit of feedback because there are two David McIntyre's. The, the uh, fog. Which, which trial? Freezing, I'm sorry. freezing of gate. Yeah, so the freeze, freezing of gate study I showed you was actually cognitive training. So if you want to try and improve your freezing, then you should hop online and get onto something like lumosity.com or BrainHQ. Um, I am in discussions with a company. I'm under a non-disclosure agreement uh, to not to discuss it. But uh, the plan I'm hoping this year is to run a drug trial for freezing, which will be looking at a, a, a novel pathway, um, which, uh, again, we'll be recruiting for. That'll be a single center trial, and that'll be here in Sydney. So um, the bottom line is that, yeah, we are trying to get trials working. People have done some drug trial work for freezing before, uh, and it hasn't been overly successful. Right. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Colin Masters has his hand up. Hi, Simon. Uh, 
Professor Masters, sir, how are you? Hey, good to see you. Great talk. Um, I don't you. agree with you about the monoclonals. Maybe, I think you're referring to the anti-tau antibodies, but uh, the data that I've seen uh, with the Roche Prazenuzumab directed against uh, uh, alpha-sin, it looks pretty good to me. Do you want to comment on that? Um, well, I guess it came out in a financial report um, that they you know, weren't happy with. It hasn't been published as far as I remember. Um, and I think it's Prazenuzumab that they're now going to take into um, the trial, which has got another Italian name. The first trial, I can't remember, it had an Italian name too. But um, essentially, I think they're going to re refine the clinical criteria and their outcome measure. So I don't think it's dead in the water, um, but there have been a couple of others um, that have also, I think there was a, a BIB, BIB or something similar, which was also reported negatively in the in the financial report. So a lot of these drug trials aren't getting published just yet. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, we have yeah. to wait. So, so this one, uh, I think the data was presented uh, at a conference uh, yeah. six months ago or something like that. Yeah, it looks as good. I say, I don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's dead, um, but I'm just a bit concerned that you know there hasn't been an overwhelming success at this stage. Yeah, but as far as I know, this is the first anti-alpha sin drug given. Yeah, I think there are two or three of them that have come out now. Um, I, I, mean, I it's quite embarrassing because I'm trying to find my talk that I gave to the MDS this year, which uh, <laughs> talked about this. But yeah, so I think we just have to to wait and, and not be too depressed but i guess at the same time you know we have to be a little bit careful about getting i guess too far down the rabbit hole yeah thanks a uh, question from shashank what were the factors considered in selecting which repurposed drugs should be tested in your clinical trials yeah so I mean, we're very lucky uh, there's a thing called the link clinical trials initiative which uh, we we have to be grateful to um Cure Parkinson's UK um, for assembling a panel of experts. And so a lot of it um, is, well, it's, it's, it's actually from different streams. So there are things like uh, the epidemiology. So mention things like, you know, smoking being associated with a reduced risk and this being associated with it. So that would be one sort of channel. And then what typically happens next is that people say, okay, is there any evidence, say, for that drug? in an animal model of the disease. And the trouble with our animal models of Parkinson's is that we've sort of got uh, two sort of different approaches. One, the old approach where we try to kill dopamine cells and say, oh, well, that looks like Parkinson's because they don't have dopamine, which really doesn't model the disease. And then much so if you like more uh, biological um, models where you might try and give a mouse a version of um, Parkinson's disease by overexpressing a gene that will overexpress the synuclein protein, which then gets tangled. Um, and so what they, they try and do is to get as much data as they can um, from those sorts of models. And of course, people are also working on Parkinson's themselves using different things. And if they see things, um, then that can lead uh, uh, people to say, oh, yes, we, you know, we should trial this. That way around where perhaps people are working in animal models um, is a little bit um, harder because, for example, you might see something in a in a in a in a it was C elegans, one of these you know little worm things, and and it may not be that that would then go into a human as well. But I guess the point is that it's a, usually a broad base, and then that that, that panel, in clinical trials panel, meet once a year, and they put forward their recommendations, and then essentially it depends a little bit on you know what the appetite is out there. But it's it's a pretty rigorous process for trying to, if you like, get the best drugs uh, to be trialed as quickly as possible. Question from James Preston. Any thoughts on the potential of introducing follicle-derived stem cells? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I'm an, a, an aficionado in all of the different types of stem cells. I guess the point that I would make is that um, in the world of stem cells itself, you can sort of think about um, those cells stem cells that effectively people have been working on for years, which is to say, okay, this isn't a cell that's going to go back into the brain, make the same, you know, hundreds of thousand co uh, connect connections that uh, the original cell had, but it's going to make dopamine. And therefore you might not need uh, to have as many of your other tablets. But that doesn't really speak to stopping the disease progression. Um, and so I think that that's a bit harder. And um, there are people out there who are talking about using stem cells, if you like, to introduce some if you like, more focused treatment. So we just talked about this thing called alpha synuclein where protein tangles and you kind of say, well, if you had a stem cell that 
produce something more biologically that could perhaps get in the way, then that might be uh, more useful. So I think that's probably where we're uh, looking at. As for, you know, whether it's pluripotent stem cells, I mean, the guys in Kyoto, um, and there's a website on, uh, there's a, a video on my website of me interviewing a guy called Roshiko Takahashi about uh, the trial that's going on there where they're using uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. The problem I see there is it takes forever uh, to, to generate those cells. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it is a bit tricky uh, to be so sure that they're really going to work. Um, but we, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it should be explored. Um, just while I remember, sinpanamab is one of the drugs, which was the BIIB054, uh, which looks like uh, Biogen didn't think it was going to be taken forwards. Uh, Prasinuzumab um, is going to be uh, taken uh, from Pasadena to Padova um, is, the, is the trial that they're, they're going to do. So um, sorry, Colin, I didn't have those uh, straight to hand when I was answering your question earlier. Uh, question from Matt Close. What products are on the horizon to reduce tremor? I am currently taking Artane, which reduces my tremor by approximately 50%. Can't wait for the 100% option. Yeah, and it's funny with Artane. I mean, Artane is such an old drug. I mean, so old now it's known as trihexphenidyl, but um, there are some concerns about drugs like Artane. I, I prescribe it a little bit for people who've got really bad tremor, but we know that it actually works on different pathways and can cause memory impairments. And in fact, there is some literature to say, oh gosh, not only memory impairments, but maybe it even increases the risk of long-term dementia. Now, I don't want you to stop taking the drug because of that potential, but um, I think the fact is we, we're not seeing a huge amount um, that's specifically for tremor, and people did look at uh, repurposing some of the epilepsy drugs um, uh, a few years ago, uh, as anisamide was looked at, and I don't think there's anything that's massively good. And I think it's really hard to exactly work out where the tremor is. And of course, it's one of those come and go symptoms. You either got tremor or it hasn't got there. So it's not there all the time, as opposed to slowness and stiffness. You should respond a bit to dopamine at varying rates, but the tremor is kind of all or none, all or none. So it is harder. Um, are there any similarities in brain scans between patients experiencing hallucinations and people who have taken hallucinogenic drugs? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, what we don't have is great compar comparable data. Um, the, the bottom line is that um, structurally, people who take um, hallucinogenic drugs would normally have a normal brain. So what you're really looking at is a functional scan and saying, okay, could you potentially um, see the same effects? And it's funny because it is trickier to see those studies being done, possibly because ethically it's a bit more challenging to try and give people things like LSD to give them hallucinatory phenomena. Um, and interestingly, uh, where it's been done, it's actually been done mainly to try and trigger auditory hallucinations, which are, which are not so common in Parkinson's disease. So I think the bottom line is structurally, the brains would look very different because people who take hallucinogenic drugs should have a normal looking brain on structure. The, um, the, the bottom line is that the Parkinson drug patients and the DLB patients, their brain will be a bit shrunk compared because they'd be A, older, and B, have a disease. In terms of the functional MRI, so the sort of scans that I was showing you, I, I did publish in, in that progress in neurobiology the fact that actually they probably do have similar neural networks when you start taking drugs. So I suspect if you did the functional MRI pictures, they might show that the same networks are being affected. And in fact, I suspect it may be the same networks for schizophrenia and auditory hallucinations, but instead of the visual cortex being the one that takes off with the default mode network, it's actually the auditory cortex. Um, so Melanie just says, thanks for the paper, Simon. Very informative seminar. Love the virtual reality application. Thank you. Michael J. Fox told me that was the craziest idea they'd ever heard, the virtual reality. They said someone's going to lie on their back in a scanner, press these pedals, and you think they're going to get freezing? They gave us the money, um, which was good. Yeah. Good, great. Seems to work out okay. <laughs> uh, question from Mari Lu. You reckon the abnormality in activity of dorsal brain network during hallucination is a general response for people who experience hallucination and that's not specific to Parkinson's patients only? I think that's probably true-ish. So it's, it's the fact that you can't engage that part of the, the network, the dorsal attention network, that would normally, if you like, say, hey, 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 I'm coming here, conflict resolution, this is the information we're going to sort it out. Um, now, in Parkinson's is a very, and, and DLB, there's a very good way of saying why that wouldn't, wouldn't work so well, because in actual fact, you kind of say, well, the dopamine system would be feeding into that network. 
Um, it's a bit harder with some of the other diseases. So like eye disease with Charles Bonnet syndrome, with macular degeneration, you can't, all the brain should be normal. So this must be all coming from the eye, but it then must be misinterpreted. Um, with other pathways, as I say, I think schizophrenia may have similar neural networks with auditory hallucinations, but just different parts of the cortex that are misfiring. Question from Anne Miller. How does PD start in the body versus originating in the brain? Amazing presentation. So look, that's very sweet. Um, if you talk to, if you look at the data, one of the things that people have recognized now for a long time is that if you, it, it, the constipation, let's just talk about constipation, we should, it's a big topic. Um, constipation is one of the strongest predictors in terms of the number of people who get Parkinson's, who complain that they had uh, constipation for several years before they got their Parkinson's. It's not very specific though, because a whole bunch of people get constipation and never get Parkinson's. But the bottom line is, we know from some of the biopsies that have been done, studied, looking at the lower bowel, the colon, and even you know going up to the, the research around the stomach, and those people who had a vagotomy that cut the nerve from their stomach to their brain, having less chance of getting Parkinson's disease, and maybe this was because it was stopped spreading up to the brain. So there's there are these sorts of um, pieces of uh, uh, evidence that are out there, and, uh, and I think at the moment that it's a it's an open top, which is why I guess the European Union funded it. Question from Sarah Barnard. What role do cannabinoids, THC, have in PD symptom management? And um, for me, you have to be very careful. Um, so there's a wonderful study from Israel about five years old now, which basically took non-hallucinating Parkinson patients. So patients who didn't have hallucinations, put them on medicinal cannabis. So that's the clean cannabis that doesn't have all that nasty stuff in it. 10% of them started hallucinating. And so you have to be very careful. The more frail cognitively you are, the more likely you are to hallucinate, no doubt about that. And interestingly, the patients who were put into the dyskinesia studies where they use synthetic cannabinoids, if you look at those studies, a number of the patients couldn't actually participate in the study because they dropped their blood pressure, they started hallucinating, and, and, and they felt awful and probably very hungry afterwards uh, with munchies. But essentially, the um, I think the, the cannabinoid story is certainly nowhere near done. We just need to be smarter about how we use it. And certainly for anxiety, sleep disorder, pain, I think there's a big role. And um, people, unfortunately, who, who may know the story, uh, we had a fantastic cannabinoid researcher here at the Brain and Mind Center who um, tragically died at a very early age from a nasty cancer. And we were actually teeing up to do a cannabinoid study, funnily enough, in tremor, uh, because that was the easiest thing that we thought we were going to go for first. And so I think the bottom line is, there is um, some merit, but it's interesting because everyone in Parkinson's thinks cannabis, it's natural, therefore it should be great. And you kind of go, if it was that great, the, the world experiment that's been going on for 500 years would have told us that. And it would be on the PBS because it's dirt cheap and it would be fantastic, but it kind of isn't for everybody. You have to be very careful with it. Mm -hmm. um, final question from Pat. You haven't spoken anything about red light therapy. Do you have an opinion on that treatment? I do. I think people should wait until the randomized control trial data shows that it can be effective. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that there's a company who are selling patients the equipment um, for a couple of thousand dollars, despite the fact that they don't have the data to support that. Now, my understanding is that there's a try before you buy. So, you know, please take it away, use it free. But anyone who's ever done trial work in Parkinson's knows the placebo effect is very large in Parkinson's. In actual fact, we've got great experiments that show that if you tell someone with Parkinson's they're about to get dopamine, a Parkinson drug, and you brain scan them, you can actually see the level of dopamine goes up by how big you tell them the dose is going to be, despite the fact that everyone gets saline. So the fact of the matter, we know the placebo effect is dopaminergic. So I think buyer beware. I think the truth is you're much better at enrolling in the trials that the guys of the red light therapy are doing, and um, so that we actually get the data to say, is this going to be effective or not? Great. Um, I don't see any further questions. Um, so thank you, Simon, very much for your time for going through all the discussions, questions. Um, yeah, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Absolutely my pleasure. Please stay safe, everybody, and hopefully we can do this in person some point soon. Thank, thank you, Simon. You. That was fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sylvie. And thank you, everybody.